to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. We just interviewed Lydia Denworth, who's the author of Friendship, subtitled The Evolution, Biology, An Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond. The bond. Friendships are super important. And uh, this year, considering most people had to stay away from each other, uh, we found how friendships are more important than ever. Has a very big deal when it comes to your neurochemistry. So I think if you got the choice between going out and hanging out with some buddies or working back late, maybe there's a good case for just uh, hanging on to your friends with a lot more value than you currently do. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Lydia. We loved your book, Friendship, The Evolution, Biology, and the Extraordinary Power of Life's Fundamental Bond. Can you start by telling us a little bit about why we need friends? <laughs> well, um, we need, you know, we've always known that friends are pleasurable, that they're, they make us feel good and all of that. But what we know now from this more recent science of friendship is that they are really uh, critical for our health. They are, in fact, I would argue over the long haul, friendship is as important as diet and exercise for your health. Uh, and it's also really interesting because now we've just begun to understand in more depth how much friendship or something like it exists in other species and how much of an evolutionary story there is to why we're so driven to connect with people. So uh, it has proven to be beneficial. There are real evolutionary advantages to being good at making and maintaining friends. And so, you know, that happens when there's, you know, you get something for it. And so it has been, it's been a critical part of our evolution as a species ourselves. Yeah, there's an, I guess an interesting, or, or maybe it's not new, but new to me anyway, that I've recently discovered after reading books like yours and, and books like uh, Humankind, a book we read recently, uh, that I always thought, you know, the, the classic is survival of the fittest, but there's a, <laughs> a new school of thought about survival of the, the friendliest as well. In, indeed, indeed. You could argue that the fittest have been the friendliest. And uh, I mean, I certainly do in my book. And it's, it doesn't mean it's the only way. I mean, the thing that's important to know about natural selection is that there are always multiple strategies that get you where you need to be. But what it means is that over time, it's been the best, you know, odds on best way to be is to be friendly and uh, to be good at interacting with other people and having a sense of what they're thinking about and all of those good things. And in, uh, is it something we see in, in other animals through our evolutionary history where it got some similarities too? Yeah. So especially non-human primates like rhesus macaques and chimpanzees. Uh, and that's where a lot of the really groundbreaking research has been done recently. Uh, but we see social behavior that looks a bit like friendship in all kinds of other species. We see it in zebras and elephants tend to hang out, you know, they, they have relationships. Um, and a lot of them are with family members or, you know, biological relatives, but it doesn't have to be. And, uh, and even, even zebra fish behave differently in the presence of familiar fish versus strange fish, they freeze if they don't recognize you. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so there is this very basic kind of social functioning that it's depending on the species. But but when you get up to non-human primates, they have brains that are more similar to ours, and their social behavior looks a lot more like ours. And and it was in those animals that researchers were able to really make the connection between social behavior and positive, you know, affiliative bonds and reproductive, reproductive success and longevity. And in evolutionary terms, you can't do better than having more and healthier babies and living longer. And that's exactly what these female baboons and rhesus macaques, that's what they do. If they, the ones who are, you know, who have the most friends, if you can put it that way, um, do the best over time. And, uh, and so in animals, in other species, you can kind of strip away some of the complex variables of human life, right? And that make it harder to assess those kinds of things in us. And, but then when you take that, what we find in the other species, and then you combine it with like epidemiological work in humans and all kinds of other studies that show that humans who are more connected are also tend to live longer and be healthier. You know, you, you get this preponderance of evidence that's really powerful. That's crazy that the uh, the amount of friends you have and the amount of friendly relationships you have impacts on, as you mentioned, your health, uh, as you mentioned, your, your 
I guess, chance of death, your lifespan, your, uh, <laughs> yes. and, and as, as you mentioned at the top, it's like almost, uh, it's up there in importance with like food and with exercise, um, which is just, I guess it, it's crazy to think like we always, the food and exercise, that's the obvious ones, but very rarely are we, do we ever talk about friendship as being up on that rung. That's right. And it's, to me, that's the most important takeaway here is that, I mean, obviously over the short term, you've got to eat and you've got to drink water and you've got, you know, you will not survive. Um, Friendship has a, it's a longer effect, but um, it is a very clear effect. And so it not only affects how long you live, but it affects, it gets under your skin is the way biologists talk about it. So friendship at one end of the continuum and loneliness or isolation at the other, it affects how your heart works. It affects your immune system, your risk of dementia, your risk of depression, your stress response, your sleep, even the rate at which your cells age. So they age faster, you biologically age faster if you're lonelier, which is sad. <laughs> it's sad. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and even, uh, I think I read a stat in your book that, Loneliness is akin to smoking 15 ciggies a day or something like that. Yeah, so Jim, yeah. <laughs> Adam, Adam, Jones, uh, Adam Jones used to be a smoker, so he could have either quit smoking or he could have just got more friends. And well, I had more friends when I smoked, so maybe they canceled <laughs> each other out. Is that the wrong way to look about it, Lydia? <laughs> well, it is. People have asked me that. Like, So if you're a parent and your teenager has friends but spends their time smoking with them, like, you know, what, what do you do? What do you, should you care about most? Um, well, it is true from public health. So let me say that smoking is the number one worst thing you can do for your health. Um, And the public health, the epidemiology is, is as, as sure about that as it is about anything, but you know, um, but smoking on your own would be very, very bad for you. (laughs) It would be worse. Um, So, you know, we're going to hope that, that it's not only a choice of those things. And what, what are the kind of trends are you seeing with the amount of friendships we're having? Like, I mean, for me, I've got my neighbors, they're nice people. I, I don't really, speak to them i think it was a few you know if i speak to my mom and dad for them in their generation it's all about neighbors and they'd have them over for dinner have them over for beers Mm. i don't know anyone really in my in my street so is the way we what, what is the direction of friendships and our connections we have with people well there's a there is a trajectory sort of over the lifespan of how friendships come and go. I mean, it can be, it's, it's variable depending on the person, but, you know, it's certainly true that when we're uh, adolescents and in university, we tend to really form intense relationships, many of which last for a very long time. And part of the reason is because you will never again be with as many people who are the same age as you. And you have, you know, you have so many opportunities to find people that you share interests with and you just spend a ridiculous amount of time together. And time turns out to be a really important factor in friendship. And, uh, and I think it's one thing we forget, we, we sort of, forget about when we get to be older adults that how much investment you have to put in both to make a friendship in the first place and then to maintain it. Um, And so what happens in your 20s, it it does depend where you live. I mean, so a lot of people, maybe they leave school and then they get a job, but that they do often spend a lot of time with their friends, but those friends might not it won't be so much based on your community as your work or your friends that you've that you're still with from school you know you're you know they they don't, they might not be right nearby and then and then of course as you get really in 30s and 40s uh, you start to have kids, you um, or, or maybe, or your career takes off and you get really busy or both, right? And people sort of joke sometimes that the 30s is where a friendship goes to die. <laughs> and I, I think it's really important for all the reasons we just talked about, for health reasons and everything, not to let that happen. But it is true that in terms of where you find your friends, uh, so like if you have young kids, you are much more likely to start to have friends that are nearby that are in the same situation whose kids are the same age, like that, that community element kind of kicks in more intensely than the, the need to connect with people just because they're close by and your, and your situation is similar. And, and it, and then later, but we do spend less time with our friends as we get, you know, through, through the middle of life. And then later in life, we spend more time again with our friends because we've got more time usually once you're, you know, if you've, you've raised kids and they're out of the house or your career is, is less intense. Um, but it is true that people 
often as adults, if they move to new cities, they find it harder to make new friends. And it can be difficult. It really can. Uh, the I think a couple of things are important to remember. One is, like I said, time is, you know, it takes something like 50 hours to go from being an acquaintance to a friend, 50 hours of sort of time together, 90 hours to consider someone a good friend, and about 200 hours to consider them a best friend. And those 200 hours need to be spent sort of chatting or catching up. You can't just like, you know, we work, sometimes you work in the same office Mm. with someone for, you know, 600 hours and you do not consider them a friend um, (laughs) because you have to connect, you have to click, right? Um, But so you have to put in the time and as an adult in a new place, you have to sort of make yourself vulnerable or you have to feel by sort of getting out there and introducing yourself, looking for people with shared interests maybe your neighbors have those shared interests and maybe they don't like, so it's a less automatic um, thing, but on the other hand, proximity. So just nearby has always, always, always for thousands of years has been recognized as an important part of friendship. But I'm guessing that with your parents' generation, it has more to do with having raised families or being in the same stage of life with people that they're living nearby. That's a good point. And as we were mentioning uh, before, uh, before we started recording, it was like the, the perfect year to launch a book about friendship when friendship <laughs> completely changed. Uh, that uh, January 2020, the book comes out and then March 2020, friendships go from meeting in person to meeting online. Uh, how did, yeah. uh, how did this, this whole lockdown uh, quarantine situation around the world impact on friendships? Uh, well, it had an enormous impact on our understanding of how important they were. And so that was what, here I went out to talk about my book when it first got published. And I thought that my job was going to be to convince people how much they needed their friends. And then the world came and took all their friends away. (laughs) And, and guess what? They realized, Oh, wow, I really need my friends. I miss them terribly. And I think what was, if there's a silver lining to this horrible, horrible thing that we've all been living through, uh, and here in the U.S., of course, it's just been a disaster, um, the, the silver lining would be that it did really remind us about the dangers of taking for granted our friends and our social connection and what we get from that. And, you know, that's why there's, you don't know what you have till it's gone <laughs> all the time. Um, and uh, And it's not that we didn't, think we cared about our friends before, but we didn't always act like it, you know? Um, And one thing that is, let me say, importantly, that in this pandemic, if you cannot physically be with your friends, you still really can work to maintain your friendships, you know, through technology, other things. It isn't, it isn't the same, not gonna, I'm not saying it is, but it's, What's really important is that is the quality of the interactions that you have, like so the conversation you have, that, and that you reach out and that you sort of pay attention to your friends and that you notice what's going on with them and if you haven't heard from someone for a while. And so it's it's about you know connecting. So biologists say there's like three minimum requirements for friendships. They're long-lasting, stable relationships. They're positive, so they make you feel good, and they're cooperative or helpful. They have a rest prosody to them. And all those things are possible, even in the COVID times, like with the restrictions. I mean, think about being a steady, reliable presence to your friends. Think about making them feel good. Have you told a friend that you appreciate him or her lately? You know, And are you trying to be helpful, even from afar? Can you show up from a distance? Um, and so I have been spending so seven months now talking about this <laughs> a lot. So from, you know, from a book point of view, it turned out to be okay for me. Um, but, but in a, but truly from my heart, it's been really good to be out there trying to help people with info, you know, full of information. I spent five years researching this stuff and then it turned out to be really, really needed right when I got out in the world to talk about it. So that has been, um, uh, you know, a, a benefit for me anyway, personally. Nice. I've got a bit of a two-part question, which is normally a no-no in podcasts, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> um, the, the, the the first part was like, how does uh, how did the replacements go in terms of how did all the, the Zoom chats, the virtual trivia nights, the, the Facebook Messenger group chats, uh, do they go a, a decent way in, in terms of replicating everybody's friendship needs? Uh, and then part two is... Uh, 
what do we do? What do we do next? So for us in Victoria, restrictions are finally easing. We can we can start to slowly see people face to face. Obviously, still some restrictions in place, but uh, mm-hmm. as we sort of go back to a what we were used to, back to a more normal way of meeting up with friends, how do we sort of transition back in? Yeah, well, good questions. So for the first part, it did depend on the person. I mean, some people really, really have sort of used Zoom as a lifeline and other people can't stand it (laughs) anymore. They've had it. Uh, And of course, there's a little bit of mix of crossover. Um, It is, uh, and and the reason is because, I mean, like Zoom is, imagine what this would have been like without the technology that we have, you know, Um, that's an important thing to say. But what I have been arguing is that when you're limited in how you can interact, you got to do the things that make you feel good. So actually a whole lot of people picked up the phone and started calling people again in a way that they hadn't been doing so much, especially the people who found like the video chats um, annoying and, and they are hard on your brain. Like they, there can be a lag from the, you know, the bad internet or there can be a delay in, in somebody's response. It doesn't feel natural. Or if you have more than two people on, you know, you interrupt each other and you can't hear and, um, and your brain actually feels all that as somewhat unnatural. Right. Um, but, but it did, it was much better than nothing for, just about everybody. And like I say, I do feel that people ended up gravitating to the things that worked for them. Now, going forward, um, well, my, my joke, and I wish I had thought of this first that I didn't, somebody heard it here, but it's so true. Friendship in coronavirus is like navigating consent in a sexual relationship now. <laughs> it, is, um, it is all about having honest and respectful conversations about people's risk tolerances, their own situations might be different. And, you know, maybe they have an elderly relative at home or, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how it is. And though I know you just had all your restrictions released, but I'm sure that doesn't mean that you can just go right back to the way it all was before. Um, And I, I think it is really important to remember that, you know, the virus is still out there. You have done a much better job containing it. But so to, try to abide by the social distancing, but like there's so much you can do. Like, I mean, just going outside and you have, you have better weather, I think in general, although I guess maybe Melbourne, is it, is it getting into winter now? Are you heading into, no, uh, no, heading you're into heading summer. into summer. You're heading yeah, yeah. into summer. Right. Okay. So lucky you, that's better. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're heading into winter um, and uh, you know, go outside, be at a distance, but, but, um, and see smaller groups of people it's um, one thing that's been interesting. I mean, here in New York City, we have all this outdoor dining that we didn't have. I mean, we had a little bit before, but it, we just weren't set up for it, right? But now they've taken over where the cars would park on the street and they've made all this outdoor dining and people really, really like it. And I think they're saying that that might live on past the pandemic because it's created a nice kind of atmosphere, a streetscape thing with, with people out on the street, you know, and, um, and I've heard that in other, some other locations too. So I think there are, might be some ways in which it changes. I mean, that has maybe a little less to do with friendship, but it certainly has to do with coming together in public places and doing it in ways that are healthy and sustainable and that seem to have added to the, cultural environment. I mean, of course, what we all want to do is like sort of fall into our best friend's arms and say, Oh, I've missed you so much. And, you know, and and we have to be careful, but, um, but I think we should cherish, we should take all the lessons we learned from missing friendship and we should now sort of make it a, continue to make it a priority and not cancel on people or say that we're too busy all the time. You know, I mean, obviously you have to do your work. You have to look after your family if you have one, but, but friendship, this, this science should give you permission to hang out with your friends, right. And say, and, and recognize that you're doing something good for your health and their health. And obviously you have to do it carefully in COVID acceptable ways, but do it. And that's what, you know, we should, we should, we shouldn't forget the lessons that the pandemic taught us about friendship. One of the movements, I guess, after the pandemic is the push to work from home. Yeah. So is there going to be unintended consequences in uh, 
the interactions and social interactions people have if they're going from five days a week in an office going out for lunch with people saying g'day to their colleagues um and going home is it something people should keep in mind when they're choosing about what level of working from home they're going to go back to yes i think so um it's I'm someone who as a writer has worked from home for a very long time. So I know all about it. So it wasn't, it wasn't a switch for me. Um, all the virtual, all this uh, zooming was, I was already doing that before too, but not to the same degree, of course. Um, but it, when you work from home as a regular thing, you really have to make a more concerted effort. You have to be more intentional about connecting with people colleagues or anybody else. Um, I mean, I try to do both. I, I really work at my relationships with other writers and reporters. Um, and I and I think that people who are just, who've made that switch now in the pandemic really need to be aware of how much um, that sort of just easy interstitial social stuff that we did at the office, you know, how much they probably got from that. I mean, not everybody likes it. Some people are probably vastly relieved and they get, they're more productive because at home sometimes, um, but we really do get something out of socializing in the office. And especially for young people, that tends to be a, a place where you really make strong relationships. And like I have, my oldest son is 22 and he's just about to start his first job. He'll be starting it remotely and, you know, very hard to connect with people and really get to know them in the same way. Um, Fortunately, I think, you know, in a few months time, he'll, he'll go there in person. So it'll be, it'll be all right. But, um, but yes, we have to be mindful. And then what you have to do is if you can't see colleagues in, you know, you got to then find that social interaction somewhere else. Yeah. Lydia, we've been speaking a lot about, I guess, assuming a lot of healthy friendships. So I'm sure there's people out there who've just got a few friends in that group, their friendship group who just plain old dickheads for you, the Australian <laughs> tank, a slang term, selfish. Uh, they're not really adding a lot to someone's life. So is there is there some elements we could think about and or is it a good idea to actually cut some friends if it is perceived as more poisonous, do you think? I do come down on the side of saying, you know, those relationships are not worth it. If they are truly poisonous or toxic, they're not good for you. I mean, they're terrible for your health, first of all, but they're also not a good use of your time. So spending time with people you care about is an excellent use of your time, but they do have to be relationships that fill those buckets I mentioned that make you feel good, that have a reciprocity to them and that are sort of reliable and stable. And, you know, by definition, toxic relationships don't do that. And it's kind of amazing how many of them we feel we have to hang on to, uh, especially I hear a lot about people who, you know, have known somebody a really long time. So they have shared history, but maybe they find them draining <laughs> or demanding, you know, um, and we should listen to the signals we're sending ourselves when we think about these things. Um, you do not have to, you only have so many hours in the day. As I said, time is a critical part of friendship and you should be dedicating a, the biggest chunk of it to the people who make you feel the best. Um, that's where you're going to get, the real health benefits of the relationships. Um, and, uh, you know, a little side effect of the pandemic has been that people's social circles have narrowed, but also that some people have said that they, that they have kind of found that, oh, wow, I really don't like how this person has behaved in this time. Or, you know, it's, it's been, it's been an interesting, um, it's been eye-opening, I guess, for some people. And so um, so when you really have to work at the connections or you have to, you know, I think you got to work harder on thinking about the ones that you really care about. And I'll just, let me just say one other thing about that is that it's easy for me to just say, yeah, <laughs> you know, get rid of that relationship. Not always so easy to do it. I fully recognize. But I think you have kind of three choices. So one is for the truly toxic relationship, I hope that people will sort of, take the opportunity to make some real changes and not have that person be as much a part of their lives. If you cannot actually drop them entirely, you, maybe you sort of shuffle them to the outer rings of your social time and make sure you get your emotional sustenance from friendship from other people. Um, there, also, you could try working on the relationship in the way that we do with romantic relationships. We often don't 
spend as much time trying to repair a friendship. But if it's somebody who you do want to keep in your life or, or who it will be hard to sever from, you know, you might want to think about actually working at it and having those hard conversations. Or like I said, then, then it's just this shuffling. So you either cut it off, you talk about it, or you kind of spend less time together. The harder relationships are the ambivalent ones where there's some good and there's some bad. They turn out to be bad for your health as well. And so then you have to do the same thing. You have to do that same calculus of how to make it better or how to make it less of your life. No, so this could be a bit of a side set, but I was just thinking when you're you're talking about obviously all the new restrictions and the new uh, the social distancing. I feel like there's almost like as an underlying element of sort of like the the fear of strangers almost again. Like we <laughs> we uh, you know we we don't want to get too close to people. If you get in the the lift with someone, both people are probably feeling super uncomfortable. You're trying to stay as far away as possible. We're not really talking to new people. Uh, Right. Is there is there going to be any sort of impacts of, of that? Like, I feel like we can't be making new friendships and just those smaller interactions um, we're going to lose. Uh, there might be. I'm very curious to see over the long haul what happens because people do really have a habit of kind of reverting to the, the norm, you know. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about what, whether handshakes will disappear entirely. Uh, and maybe they should from a, you know, it is an evolutionary thing about showing that you're not infectious <laughs> is what they think. And, you know, obviously that, that, that was <laughs> actually mattered right now. Um, and, but I, um, I hope what happens is that we, we don't, yeah, do, we don't, we abide by the rules in such a way that it does allow us to still have conversations with people, including new people. I mean, I think I, the people I feel most for right now are those who are in situations where they were just about to try to meet new people and they don't have that many people around them that they already knew. And it's much harder to make a new friend during COVID than it is to maintain an existing relationship. And so, um, but quality matters most. So if you have to pick, <laughs> right, quality over quantity, and those it, those sort of more lingering relationships are, um, we get we do get benefit from that. But in the grand scheme of things, they're less important. So I would say, you know, put your energy and your worry into those couple of core relationships, but try not to become that person who just shrinks entirely from society. I think most of us won't. I think we, we are, as we, as I said at the beginning, driven to connect socially and we will still be. Amazing. So uh, as we approach the end now, Lydia, our podcast audience, they're all book lovers, extremely curious people. Do you have any book recommendations? Ah, um, let's see. Uh, you didn't warn me that I was <laughs> I needed to do that. Um, uh, I do, I do. So um, I'm not sure what all is out in Australia, but I assume some of the same. So it's been interesting to see that there's several other books about relationships that have been a big deal here in the U.S. this year. One is Together by Vivek Murphy, who was the former Surgeon General here for President Obama. Um, his book came out here in April. I'm assuming it's there or it will be. And it's really good too. It's a sort of a continuation of what I, um, of what I wrote about. Uh, and um, I also, I don't know, maybe this is too American centric, but um, we are speaking during the week of the American presidential election. So I just had to read a book for work called Predisposed, which is about the liberal and conservative differences in the brain and biology and political neuroscience. And it was fascinating. It's super readable. And I think it would be very relevant even in other countries because it is, it's more about the sort of basic liberal and conservative bias. It, I mean, it, some of it is about specifics of American politics, but, but I thought it was fascinating and, um, and just a really good read. And I'd imagine somewhat relevant to your work as well because that tension sometimes between the two trains of thought could be a, a real hurdle between people actually having a connection and friendship and it might be driving wedges, whereas maybe understanding the other side and having empathy would be a way of overcoming that. Yeah, this has been a big topic of conversation here in the U.S. for the last four years and certainly right now. Um, again, it, it continues. It's 
When you have divisions as extreme as we seem to in this country right now, it is it can be very hard to bridge those. And there is a reason why we tend to be friends with people who share our worldview. So similarity matters in a bunch of different ways, but that's one of the most important ones. So that would mean that, you know, you can be different ages, different races, all kinds of things. But if you have the same worldview, you're going to have an easier time connecting. Um, it does matter though. Empathy is a critical piece of friendship and social connection. And it's got to be what sort of saves us from this, this huge divide. Um, and I, what I hope is that we can still remember that, you know, there are individual people on all sides and that they have their own reasons and experiences that get them where they are. There are some things that, you know, I personally find unacceptable uh, in, in the political debate we're having right now. And so I don't feel the need to try to be friends with the people on the extremes um, that, you know, the opposite from me, but I, um, but I do think it, it, you know, we need to, we do need to try to come to the middle. I, I'm hoping that that will be easier when we have different language from leaders that are telling us about what we share instead of what divides us. Uh, and we need to remember that, but, um, you know, now I'm getting off on my political tangent here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's hard not to this week. <laughs> exactly. It's certainly the week for it. And, uh, what's coming up next for you? I know you previously did a, a book on, uh, on hearing and the impacts on the brain. And I think you hung out with some bo- baboons studying them for a little while when you, were, when you're looking into friendship, what's the next project? I did. Yeah. The next project. So I'm just, I've just actually signed on to be a right to co-write a book with, um, with a woman who is a surgeon and a social scientist in Chicago. And so like me, she's interested in hearing and early brain development in kids. But this, this book is, I mean, uh, it's really about the critical, critical nature of those first few couple years of life for the brain development, but also then how much society tends to get in the way by not giving parents, by not making it possible for parents to engage and be parents in the way they want. Cause I mean, so here in the U S we got no paid parental leave. We got no, not, you know, it's like, there's a whole bunch of policy reasons, but, but really it's about, um, it's about sort of coming together and recognizing how important those cup, those years are and what we could do um, as a public health matter to, um, to strengthen that time and even the playing field. So that's what I'm doing. It's very early stages. So plus journalism, I still, I write for Scientific American here and I do a bunch of other things. Fantastic. Well, if, uh, if people are keen to find out more about your books and more about your work, yeah. where, should we, uh, where should we point them to? Uh, the best place, my website, which is LydiaDenworth.com. Um, and it's got, and then you can, I mean, and on social media, on Twitter and Instagram and everything, I'm at Lydia Denworth. Um, but the website is a, is a central, you can find out everything, books, articles, you know, speaking, all kinds of things. It's all there. Fantastic. Lydia, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and sharing a bit about friendship. Thank you so much for having me. At the end of every month, we send out a, an email, which is a recap of the month just gone, where we give a bit of our brutal feedback, a bit of brutal honesty. We give the books a rating out of 10, where you can see what Adam Ashton thought of the book and you can see what Adam Jones thought of the book. And we also give you a teaser as to the four or five books that are coming up next. So if you want to be one of the first to know which episodes are coming up next, sign up to the email list where at the end of each month, you'll get a recap email. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash email.